good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Today, closing this fantastic two days of uh, talks on microbiome science, I will mostly focus on the feline microbiome in GI disease based on my also my personal experience. And we will touch on the differences between the feline uh, microbiome and dysbiosis compared to, to dogs. And I will give you some clinical example, real clinical case examples. Like previously from the other speakers, I just wanna uh, clarify that the, the, what you will hear are my personal opinions and they are not necessarily shared by the views of Nestlé Furina Pet Care Company or its affiliates. Okay, so it, it's compulsory for me to touch on some of the um, topics that have already been touched uh, previously by the other speakers. And like the Latin used to say, a repetita juvent. So I'm sure you won't, you won't mind. And as I, I told Jan yesterday after his fantastic talk, I really liked the way he started his presentation by saying that we have to change completely the way we, we think of GI uh, physiology. And I totally share his, um, his statement. And, uh, and this is why, because we always, especially as clinicians, focused on mostly on the intestinal uh, epithelial side of things and almost forget that there is a huge, highly diverse, balanced ecosystem, how uh, microbiome, intestinal microbiome, which has a central role in what we call gut hemostasis, okay? So maintaining health of our uh, GI tract, but also how uh, systemic, systemic health. And I remember during the time of my residency, I was studying a lot on the uh, pathophysiology of chronic enteropathies. And I re we knew already back then in the early 2000s that the microbiota, the intestinal microbiota, had a di direct role in controlling not only the growth function integrity of the intestinal tract, but especially in modulating the activity of the immune system, the mucosal immune system, both the innate and the adaptive uh, immune system, allowing for the immunity to be in a sort of uh, anti-inflammatory environment, if you want, immunoregulatory uh, environment. Uh, avoiding inappropriate chronic self-perpetuating immune responses against luminal uh, antigens. And we always thought that this happened because of the direct interaction of bacteria or part of the um, cell with um, immune, immune cells. And this is obviously true. But what we know now is that another probably the most interesting function of the, of the microbiota and the way he interacts with the immune system, it's its metabolic function. So you heard from Dr. Winston uh, comparing the, 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 the intestinal microbiota to the metabolic function of the liver. And that's absolutely true. So the, the microbiota has to be seen as a true metabolic organ. We actually know that in people, in adult people, it weighs almost uh, two kilos, eh? between one and a half and two and two kilos. So what we know now is, as I was saying, is most of the interaction is actually not uh, uh, directly due to the to the mechanical interaction of bacteria with the immune system, but it's actually due to what they produce, beneficial metabolites they produce from uh, digestion or dietary components, look at short chain fatty acids. You've heard a lot about short chain fatty acids, which are the product of uh, fermentation of dietary fiber. Uh, and uh, we know that some bacterial species, some strains are particularly good in fermenting fiber. And one of these is Fecalibacterium uh, prosniti, but there are, there are others. And you also heard how Clostridium milanonis is the only bacterium able in, in both dogs and cats to convert primary fecal bile acids into secondary bile acids. And, but we also need to remember that there are other metabolic pathways involving, for example, tryptophan or lipid metabolism. And all these metabolites, they can contribute to the integrity of the, the gastrointestinal structure they can ensure, allow for the immunity, mucosal immunity to remain in an anti-inflammatory uh, 
uh, states. But we also know that they are able to control metabolism outside of the gastrointestinal tract. Think about um, insulin sensitivity, think about GI motility, and think about also the, the interaction between the gut and the brain, the so-called gut-brain axis. So there's much more than just physical interaction with the uh, antigen presenting cells or epithelial cells. Okay, so today I need to make it quite, quite practical, okay? This is also my role in, in this topic, is to make things practical. So what we, we have to remember is that the microbiome, the intestinal microbiome of cats, exactly like in people or in dogs, once it's finished this transitory state, uh, so we think actually in kittens at, of around three months of age, the, the endogenous microbiota becomes quite stable. But we need to remember there are several stressors factors that can actually have a negative impact on, uh, on the uh, microbiota, not only the composition, but also its function. And I'm listing some of them. And I've, as you can see, highlighted antimicrobials, which we often overprescribe, and we will talk about this later on in the talk. And we know that antimicrobials can have a huge negative impact on the uh, intestinal microbiome, especially early in life, so in, in, growing, in growing cats, whose microbiome is still in a, in a developing uh, phase. And of course, we all immediately think about chronic enteropathies, chronic perpetuating inflammation that will also have a huge impact, negative impact on the feline uh, uh, microbiome. So, Intestinal microbiome dysbiosis, so the alteration of the very complex ecosystem we've been, we've been hearing about in these two days, which could relate to uh, change in richness, diversity, or function of the intestinal microbiota, is very common in gastrointestinal disease. And we have to see it in a cause-effect uh, fashion, huh? a little bit like the chicken and the egg. Uh, Dr. Wisdom was also referring about earlier on. So we know that, especially, for example, in chronic enteropathies, microbiome dysbiosis has a role in the pathogenesis of this complex uh, disease. But we also know that gastrointestinal disease will lead to uh, dysbiosis, intestinal dysbiosis. Much more commonly than we actually think in feline, uh, in feline practice. And we need to remember that this biosis uh, is not all the same. There are several causes and several patterns of this biosis which will lead to different consequences. And we have to keep this in mind. We will see later on when we have to think about how approach the dysbiosis from a treatment point of view. For example, if one of our patients, feline patients, is actually eating a poor quality diet, that could actually lead to uh, um, increase in residual uh, osmotic hmm, substances that can actually lead to osmotic and secretory diarrhea. This is a type of dysbiosis, which we actually very commonly see. You heard yesterday from the beautiful talk from Linda Torreson and also Dr. Sukodolsky that there are cases where some beneficial bacteria, bacteria, for example, Clostridium melanonis, are actually completely lacking. And due to the loss, we can have uh, an accumulation of, let's say, toxic metabolites, for example, primary uh, bile acids. And this could lead not only to mucosal irritation, but also to overgrowth of uh, pathobiomes or enteropathogens. This is another type of dysbiosis. And we often see cases where the dysbiosis actually is due to a total uh, increase in total bacterial abundance. And as we've just said, there might be as a result an excess of uh, toxic uh, metabolites and an excessive stimulation of the immune system. And also we will see today an example of this pattern of dysbiosis. We might actually have an increase in mucosa associated bacteria, which will, uh, of course, lead to inflammation, activation of the mucosal immune system. So again, these are different types of dysbiosis that we can actually find in our day-to-day -day cases. 
So it's important for us, we need to realize that it's important for us to remember that dysbiosis has a, is quite common in GI disease, has a central role in GI disease. Therefore, being able to assess the intestinal microbiota becomes very clinically useful. And you know, we, we learned from, from several studies, publications, but also beautiful talks from Dr. Sukodolsky and his, and his uh, collaborators, that there are several ways of assessing the intestinal microbiome, moving from uh, uh, molecular sequencing tools down to uh, fecal and, and serum uh, metabolomics. But I want to stress that the, the utility, clinical utility in day-to-day -day practice of this, uh, uh, especially the molecular sequencing tools, is quite, it's quite limited. There are several issues, not just to mention a few, the, the cost that is quite sometimes prohibitive, and also the turnaround time, uh, let alone all the issues about repeatability and uh, av availability of, this, of these techniques. So I'm going to focus for the next few minutes on two ways of assessing intestinal microbiome, which we gastroenterology often use. Uh, one is fluorescent in situ hybridization or fish, which you might uh, remember associated with granulomatous, the diagnosis of granulomatous colitis of boxers and of French bulldogs. And the dysbiosis index, which is, as you just heard, a, a quantitative uh, PCR. So FISH uh, uses, it's an immunofluorescent uh, tool technique, which is based on the use of what we call probes, bacterial probes. These are complementary DNA sequence to the uh, target genome sequence of our bacteria. And that could be all the bacteria or some specific group. These are labeled with uh, fluorescence uh, cytochromes which will then lead to a colorimetric reaction when that specific target bacteria is found. And FISH has been used in the past in feces, but we use it more often on tissues or formally fixed uh, tissue. And we know already from early 2000s that uh, FISH allow us to study the relationship between the intestinal microbiota, the mucosa associated microbiota, and chronic inflammation in cats. This is a study from Janetsko and others from 2008 that literally looked at the relationship of mucosal bacteria and intestinal inflammation. And the authors found uh, through FISH an increase in mucosal adherence enterobacteria. We know that enterobacteria tends to increase in uh, dysbiosis. And the interesting thing finding was that the number of Escherichia coli, which is member of the Enterobacteriaceae, but also Clostridium, was associated with fecal with clinical activity. Uh, so the, the severity of clinical clinical signs, histological changes, intestinal epithelial histological changes, and also marker of inflammation on uh, on on our intestinal mucosa. And a more recent study used fish to compare the relationship of uh, mucosa associated bacteria in cats with chronic enteropathy, idiopathic chronic enteropathy, versus cats with small cell lymphoma. And the authors found an increased number of fusobacteria, which is quite interesting. I will tell you in a second why in the ileum and the colon of cats with uh, small cell lymphoma compared to cats with uh, IBD or chronic enteropathy. And this increase of fusobacterium was associated with an increased number of um, inflammatory cells, uh, dendritic cells, and also activation and increased expression of uh, nuclear transcriptor factor kappa beta, which is a pro-inflammatory transcription. Uh, factor. So the authors actually thought whether fusobacteria could actually have a role in the pathogenesis of small cell lymphoma. And the interesting finding I mentioned earlier on is that fusobacteria in people is associated with development of colorectal uh, cancer. And in this beautiful picture, uh, this fish uh, picture that I've taken from the paper, you can see the blue, the dark blue stains um, 
part is the intestinal epithelial, and then you see a mass of orange staining uh, uh, dots. These are the fusobacteria that are included in, uh, in the epithelial mucus. Um, and this is what uh, FISH does, allows you to not only identify bacteria, but also to locate them in the intestinal, the intestinal mucosa. But now I want to spend a few, a few minutes talking about the dysbiosis index, which we said earlier on, it's a quantitative uh, PCR. That, as you know, you heard yesterday, uh, measure total bacterial abundance and then the total abundance of seven key bacterial groups. So these are bacteria that belong to the core macro, microbiota Jan Sukudolsky was referring to yesterday in his uh, presentation. Core microbiota that we know from uh, deep sequencing uh, uh, studies. And uh, through a mathematical uh, algorithm that Jan was mentioning about yesterday, we can generate a number which tells us how uh, significant the dysbiosis is. And we know, we've known for many years that uh, the dysbiosis index was validated in, in dogs with chronic uh, uh, enteropathies. And the news is, the great news for people like me, clinicians like me, who see lots of cats and are cat frenzy, if you want, is that now this uh, test is actually available and validated for cats as well with chronic enteropathy. Thanks to the, to the work of Dr. Sung, Jan and the rest of, of, the, of the group at Texas A&M University and the GI lab. So I just want to spend more, a little bit of time on uh, help us on how to interpret uh, the dysbiosis index. So firstly, let's look at the dysbiosis index itself. So that numerical uh, index I just mentioned. And we know that the majority of normal, uh, normal cats have a dysbiosis index below zero, and that would uh, equate to normal, so eobiosis. Whether dogs with dysbiosis, will, cats with dysbiosis, excuse me, will have a dysbiosis index above zero, okay? If the index is between zero and one, we usually think this will indicate a mild to moderate shift in terms of the overall variety of the intestinal uh, microbiota, whether this biosis index uh, more than one, it's indicative of significant shift in terms of the overall uh, microbial community and, and diversity. And this is a difference from the dysbiosis index in dogs, where let's say the mild uh, dysbiosis range is up to two and the significant uh, dysbiosis is over, over two. But then be, besides the, the index, we also need to look at the individual key uh, bacterial groups we, we've been referring uh, earlier on, which are listed over here in this table, together with the function, the majority of them, five of them are beneficial species from Fecalibacterium, Turicibacter, Bifidobacterium, Bacteroides. These are two specific key groups of the feline dysbiosis index, which you will not find in the canine dysbiosis index. And the majority of them, as I said, are short chain fatty acids uh, producers. And in this biosis, they tend to decrease. But we also have two pathobionts. So still inhabitant, commensal inhabitants of our uh, microbiome that in certain circumstances can actually become pathogens. So they can behave like pathogens. That's what pathobionts means. And we know these are Streptococcus and Escherichia coli and we know that in this biosis, uh, in specific pattern of this biosis, they tend to increase. So if we have a cat with a normal dysbiosis index, but uh, a shift of one of these species outside of the, the reference range, well, we know that that actually equates to a mild or a simple form of dysbiosis. So we have to pay attention also to the individual uh, bacterial groups. And thanks to the study of uh, Dr. Sangs and, 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 and Dr. Sukodolsky, we know that exactly like in dogs, a good proportion of cats with chronic uh, enteropathy will have a dysbiosis index above uh, uh, zero. 
uh, what's interesting to, to note is in this validation study, this publication from Dr. Sung, we can see that some healthy cats, these are cats with no clinical signs, no clinical pathological abnormalities, the dysbiosis index was actually in the pathological range, if you want. And the question mark is whether this could actually mean subclinical disease, because we know that dysbiosis can also exist in subclinical form, like many other, many other diseases. And this is a very interesting uh, point for, for a clinician like me, is that if you compare the frequency of uh, altered dysbiosis index to other marker of chronic uh, GI disease or uh, concurrent uh, diseases we see in cats with, with chronic enteropathy, you'll see from, from the study of Dr. Sung is that the uh, abnormal dysbiosis in index were, was more frequent, frequently found compared to other markers we more commonly reach to, for example, cobalamin or serum folates or pancreatic, specific pancreatic uh, uh, lipase. And this also means that the dysbiosis index could serve as a marker of an early, early GI, GI disease. And, and for me, as a clinician, this is a beautiful, beautiful um, thought. And like we saw earlier, the dysbiosis index, the proof of concept, has been shown also in cats with uh, small cell lymphoma. And although you will see from the graph a certain overlap uh, in the uh, dysbiosis index of cats with IBD or chronic enteropathy versus a small cell lymphoma, you can appreciate how with the increasing in disease severity in terms of alteration of GI structure that you see from uh, moving from IBD to small cell lymphoma, there is an increasing trend in the dysbiosis index uh, as well. And you heard a lot yesterday and today as well about Clostridium iranonis, that like in, in cats, like in dogs, is the only bacterium able to convert primary uh, fecal bile acids into secondary beneficial uh, fecal bile acids. Uh, this biosis index allow, allows us, specifically uh, qPCR, allows us to, to quantify the total abundance of Clostridium iranonis. And what we can see and this is a difference from what we see in dogs, is that only around 30% of cats with chronic enteropathy will actually have a Clostridium iranonis below the reference range that you see here in the gray shaded uh, area. And only few of these cats will actually have a, uh, a total abundance of Clostridium iranonis that we associate with uh, lack of um, secondary bile acid uh, production. And just to show the, the solidity of, the, of, the, of this uh, test in cats as well as in dogs, we are able to predict the percentage of primary bile acids in the normal range just by looking at the uh, total abundance of Clostridium uh, iranonis with a 92% uh, um, uh, accuracy. Okay, let's start to get a little bit more, more clinical. So, so what are our treatment options? Mm -hmm. we, are, we can use or think of in a cat with chronic GI signs where we suspect uh, or we have diagnosed intestinal uh, dysbiosis. And I'm gonna um, touch on, on something that you've heard already. So dysbiosis is not just one, one uh, one for all. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spectrum of, uh, it's a spectrum of, in terms of marker of GI disease. And so choosing the right strategy will depend on the type of dysbiosis, meaning on the underlying cause of uh, dysbiosis. On the duration of dysbiosis, we will see this, especially in antibiotic induced uh, dysbiosis and the severity of dysbiosis. So we cannot treat all dysbiosis and approach all dysbiosis in the same way. So we will often be confronted with the choice of a multimodal approach, which we usually think of in cases of dysbiosis, uh, 
coming from severe chronic GI disease, this is a sequential uh, approach that we often uh, think of in more simple forms of dysbiosis or more severe, less severe cases. And when we think about the target of, the, of our treatment strategy, we need to realize that in cats with severe chronic enteropathy associated dysbiosis, it might be realistic, more realistic and acceptable to aim for clinical remission rather than uh, dysbiosis remission or eubiosis versus cats with, for example, antibiotic induced uh, uh, dysbiosis where cure can actually be a realistic target. So these are concepts we have to, to, um, to, to think of. You've heard over the, these two days of several treatment options and, and the mechanism of actions of, of, of uh, the different uh, uh, treatment modalities, but we also have to, to, to pay attention for the possible limitation of the side effects. And I will just uh, uh, focus a little bit on antibiotics, which we know will interfere, interact, modulate the intestinal microbiota mostly by reducing the total number of bacteria and in some cases uh, reducing the number of mucosa adherent uh, bacteria, therefore leading to dampening of the uh, inflammatory response and reducing production of uh, toxic metabolites. But we have to remember the side effects of antibiotics, not only uh, antimicrobial resistance, but also, given that we are talking about intestinal microbiome, the negative impact on uh, intestinal microbiota. Therefore, these biosis that we will see in some cases can actually be quite long, uh, long lasting. So each treatment strategy has its own mechanism of action. You've heard about all of them in this in these two days, and there might be cases where we'll be uh, using a multimodal approach, meaning literally using all of these treatment options. Now, we, we have to remember this though, the weather diet, and we, we talked about this as well, will impact or not, and to what extent, to what degree on the microbiota, intestinal microbiota of cats in, in, in terms of being able to cause a major uh, shift from, from the normal situation, we know that diet is very eff efficacious in controlling clinical signs in cats with chronic GI signs. This is a beautiful study, beautiful because it's based on almost a thousand cats from first opinion. This is a British study from Arti Catrani and, and the others at the Royal Veterinary College in London. So almost 1,000 cats presented to first opinions with chronic GI signs of unknown origin. So where all the common causes have been uh, ruled out. And what we see from this study is that, uh, like we already know, is that the majority of these cats, when uh, trialed with a, a diet, in this case, a hydrolyzed diet, will go into clinical remission. Diet alone, without any other treatment uh, modality. On the contrary, the 283, so almost 30% of this study population of cats, they receive diets alongside other, uh, let's say second line or third line or final line uh, treatments, for example, antibiotics or glucocorticoid steroids, only 40% of these cats actually achieved clinical remission. So we, we can think in why that would be the case, perhaps because these cats suffered from a more severe uh, form of intestinal uh, disease. Well, I'm thinking perhaps because these cats actually, part of the clinical science in these cats were actually due to the negative effect of antibiotics. So let's remember the diet will be a key uh, part of our treatment strategy in cats with uh, uh, dysbiosis or chronic GI signs. And now I'm gonna focus again on, on antibiotics. So I mentioned earlier on the, the negative effects. Let's not forget before moving on to the effect on the intestinal microbiota, that antibiotics will very commonly induce in our patients, GI toxicity. So gastrointestinal signs and worsening of uh, fecal scores like we heard just uh, in the previous uh, 
talk from Dr. Hui. And this is true from amoxicillin clavulanate, and this is true for clindamycin, which are two broad spectrum antibiotics we often see used in feline uh, practice. And, um, and these were healthy. These were two studies from the same year, recent studies, looking at the effects of antibiotics in clinical science of healthy uh, cats and whether the use of probiotics or symbiotics were able to, to reduce this clinical science. But we also know, and this is a recent study from Jacqueline Whitmore and her group, that uh, clindamizing given at a high dose for 21 days in healthy cats, he's able to induce a severe shift in the uh, intestinal microbiome uh, composition of cats with the uh, installment of a situation very similar to what we see in diseased cats, so chronic enteropathic cats. And you can appreciate this just by the, the heat uh, map. And after this continuing uh, clindamizing, not all cats, as you can appreciate from this uh, picture, were able to return to the, to the situation pre-antibiotic. Uh, anti and in addition to the dysbiosis, so the alteration of the macrobiota composition, the authors also showed a serious derangement in all those very important metabolic pathways we, we talked about earlier on in, in, this, in this talk. In some cases, lasting, long lasting derangements. And thanks to the, to the dysbiosis uh, index, we now know that amoxicillin as well is able to induce a, a form of dysbiosis uh, comparable to what we see in cats with chronic enteropathy, as you can see from the, from the graph on the, on, the, on the left. And when we look at the specific groups, uh, bacterial groups of interest, for example, Colstidium iranonis, you can see how much more cats compared to cats with chronic enteropathy were actually had a reduced abundance of Colstidium iranonis eight out of uh, 10 compared to the three out of 10 that I mentioned uh, earlier, earlier on. And if we look at Escherichia coli, uh, seven days of amoxiclavulanate was able to induce an increase in this pathobionts as well in a more severe, more significant way we, that we actually saw in cats with real chronic GI disease. Okay, we, we are approaching now the, the end of my, of my talk and I wanna show you some case, case example. And I wanna start with um, a, case, a very particular case. Sometimes, and I wanna stress sometimes, quite very rarely, antibiotics might be needed. I showed you in the table with the mechanism of actions for controlling the number of mucosa adherent bacteria. Sometimes antimicrobials might be needed to control cats with dysbiosis. I wanna show you an example, probably the only example I have to, to show you where antibiotic was crucial in the clinical remission. So this is Jamil, he's a young cat, a domestic shorter cat. You can already appreciate quite a skinny, skinny cat that we saw when he was quite young for really like really long standing chronic uh, uh, diarrhea associated with hematochitia, tenesmus, so fecal tenesmus straining to defecate, ravenous appetite. There was not much uh, by a normal body condition. He was actually losing weight. And by the time we saw him, he only weighed 2.2 kilos. And in the real terror, he looks almost half of, the, of his brother, the, the companion cat. These were the fecal consistency and the range of consistency of feces in, in Jamil when, I, when, we, when we saw him. And this was going on for a long time. And when we looked at his uh, history, medical history, what we could see that is at the beginning of the problem, he was trialed on different uh, diets. Uh, types like we just said we should be doing, but because of a positive uh, Giardia ELISA test, he received several cycles of fembendazole followed by long cycles of metronidazole to which there was no clinical response so much that at the end the, 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 
the referring clinician, they had started a young cat on immunosuppressive uh, therapy. And again, there was no response. And interestingly, when Jamil was receiving metronidazole, he developed vomiting and his ravenous appetite actually worsened. So when we saw Jamil, like we, we do in cats with chronic GI sign, we wanna make sure that there are no uh, causes for the GI signs. And we wanna make sure that there are no concurrent diseases. So we did a, a relatively extensive uh, workup. And you will see, we also looked at uh, enteropathogens, specifically protozoa and, and coccidia, and we were able to rule them out. On abdominal ultrasound, everything was pretty much normal with the exception of the colon that was quite significantly thickened and distended by very liquid, uh, very liquid uh, material. So at this stage, given the uh, refractory uh, nature of the, of the clinical signs, we tried a final uh, treatment plan, which included the use of uh, fiber enriched diets together with pro probiotics after this continuing uh, corticosteroids, but we only achieved a very partial improvement. So we decided, despite the fact that Jamil was still a relatively young cat to proceed to uh, GI endoscopy. So we performed the gastrododenoscopy, colonoscopy, we collected how several uh, mucosal biopsy. And interestingly, the, the significant changes on histopath were specifically related to the colon, which showed a severe erosive uh, inflammation with predominant uh, infiltration, proper infiltration of neutrophils. In some areas, almost uh, resembling granulomatous type of inflammation. And because of this, we wanted to exclude intracellular pathogens or the pathogens associated with granulomatous inflammation and all the, the additional stains as well as uh, feline coronavirus immunohistochemistry were done and they were negative. So at this stage, we requested a fish, which I showed you earlier on. And from fish, what we could actually appreciate is that the protective mucus layer that you have seen at the beginning of the talk and you heard about during these two days was completely disappeared from the colon of, of, uh, of Jamil. And what you can see here are a pretty degenerate um, colonic epithelium with a high number of rods completely adherent to the uh, epithelium itself. In this picture, you can see actually epithelial debris due to the erosive nature of the, of the disease with a huge number of bacteria attached, uh, attached to it. And some of these rods were actually invasive. So they were found also in the intestinal, in the intestinal crypts. So thinking of a possible case of granulomatous colitis in cats uh, associated to adhesive and invasive E. coli, we requested uh, E. coli specific fish, which was negative as well as a Campylobacter specific fish, which was negative. So in this case, we were bound to try antimicrobial. In this case, we, we thought of tylosine, uh, 10 milligram per kilogram twice a day, in order to try and reduce the number of bacteria adhering to the mucosa. And what we could actually see after seven days, to much of a uh, surprise that Jamil had a, a clinical improvement. So his hematochitia resolved, the fecal consistency, as you can see from the feature, started to, to improve, and also the frequency of defecation and the straining improved, as well as his body weight. And when we looked again at Jamil at one month for tylosine, what we could see is that it was very difficult for us to distinguish him from his uh, brother. Okay, that's, that's Jamil. He received tylosine for one month, together with his uh, fiber rich diet and his probiotics. And what you can see is that uh, at one moment, his fecal consistency was normal. We were able to win him off tylosine and continuing on, on uh, diets and probiotics. And this is a picture of uh, Jamil here again on the right at his birthday. And you can appreciate that it's very difficult to distinguish it from, from his brother. And I want to stress that Jamil did not continue antibiotic long term and is now 
uh, to today, to this day, free of symptoms. This is a, to show you to what extent we went in this case before using antibiotic, okay? And now I wanna show, show you a very common case presentation that we see, that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. This is another young cat, his name is Lupin, beautiful cat. He was referred as well, actually from a, from a internal medicine uh, diplomat, so a specialist for management of chronic uh, small intestinal uh, diarrhea. The story is quite interesting of Lupin because when the colleague looked for an underlying cause, he found no, no. So he decided to, like we said, approach him with dietary changes. He tried different type of diets, but none of them actually achieved remission. And somehow they ended up with resorting to amoxicillin clavulanic acid. And the interesting thing is that Lupin achieved remission when he received amoxicillin clavulanic acid. But the moment the antibiotic was discontinued, he gradually returned to liquid, liquid stools. Therefore, amoxicillin was restarted. And by the time we saw him, he had receiving amoxiclavulanate for almost uh, six months. And interestingly, and we touched on this yesterday, over time, the responsiveness to, to amoxiclavulanate was lost. So the diarrhea became resistant to antibiotic as well. And so this is what we did as part of our diagnostic approach. So we requested this biosis index. This is the this biosis index of, of Lupin. You will see from a um, general point of view that this biosis index was quite, shifted from the normal with, a, with an index of 2.2. And we were amazed to see how severely, severely reduced Clostridium melanonis was almost absent one month after this continuation of antibiotics. So if we wanted to place Lupin in the graphs we saw earlier, that's where he would, he would stand, okay? Severe dysbiosis with extremely low number of Clostridium melanonis. So in this case, what we did was to think about uh, fecal macrobiota transplantation. You heard a beautiful talk from Dr. Winston, and you saw some interesting data from the presentation from Dr. Hui. And this is the protocol we used. Um, we used two and a half grams of feces per kilo body weight of Lupin. And I wanna just uh, say that the as part of the screening of our donor, we used this biosis index and our donor this biosis index were very, very uh, similar to what we see in healthy cats. So minus 2.4 and all key groups were in range. We blended it like you heard many people do and we administered, as you can see from the video with a large bore catheter and look at how well tolerated this procedure is in Lupin. He's actually an actor. He knew we were recording for for the talk and he's showing his best, uh, his best look. I covered the audio because he wasn't really appreciating the, the beginning of the procedure. As you can see, although the majority of cats will need a sedation, Lupin uh, undergone the procedure completely awake with minimal uh, restraint. And we kept him in the hospital for four hours. Uh, most of the time because of inhibition, they will not use the litter tray. And I'm gonna show you what happened one week after the, the one and only FMT in terms of FIGO consistency. And what happened at one month post FMT. So you can see that although perhaps the FIGO score is not perfect, we were uh, quite happy to see that after so much time of chronic diarrhea, we were able to achieve clinical remission just by one uh, FMT, and I, I, I must say for, for, for completion that we are actually waiting on the results of this biosis index post uh, uh, FMT in, uh, in, uh, in Lupin. And we don't know, I mean, his, this biosis was quite severe and we know that if this biosis is quite severe, it is possible that there might be an underlying uh, significant alteration of the GI structure. So it is possible that Lupin might need further FMTs, but I would say that this is much safer uh, 
well tolerated um, treatment options compared to anti antibiotics. So I want to finish with some take on uh, messages from a clinician point of view. So we have to remember that intestinal dysbiosis is very common in feline GI diseases. So several of the, of the cats we see on a daily basis are actually dysbiotic. This doesn't necessarily help us because dysbiosis can actually due to different causes like we see. So it could be the results of a severe structural gastrointestinal disease like chronic enteropathy or small cell lymphoma, or also the results of uh, drugs, so an external stressors, and antibiotics are the, the, the major culprit. If we don't diagnose dysbiosis in time, so if we don't address it over time, dysbiosis can itself lead to chronic derangement of the gut uh, homeostasis. And dysbiosis index, from a clinical perspective, is a very good tool to make a rapid evaluation of the total uh, macrobiota of the, of the seven key bacterial groups from the core microbiome, and therefore make an early diagnosis of dysbiosis. In some cases, subclinical dysbiosis. Like we said earlier on, treatment of intestinal dysbiosis in cats will depend on the underlying cause. And often, especially in severe cases or cases of chronic enteropathy, we will need a multimodal approach. And our target might be clinical remission rather than cure. Uh, but in some cases, for example, antibiotic-induced dysbiosis in young cats or cats with uh, protozoal uh, enteropathy, protozoal associated infection associated dysbiosis, uh, cure might be a realistic uh, target and unimodal treatment strategy might be actually possible. And based on the current uh, evidence we have in the literature, diet should be the first line uh, treatment in cats with chronic GI signs and possibly with, with uh, uh, dysbiosis and should always be part and remain part of a multimodal treatment uh, strategy. As we said, besides, and this is a major problem, don't, don't, I'm not downplaying, but besides inducing antimicrobial resistance, antibiotics have a huge negative impact of the intestinal macro, microbiome and the intestinal health. And they should not be used routinely like it used to be in the past, like unfortunately many of, of us still do as a diagnostic tool in the approach, uh, let alone the management, but also the approach of cats with chronic GI signs. In some rare, rare cases like Jamil, I showed you, antibiotics might be useful in managing mucosa associated dysbiosis, but only at the end of a very extensive and sequential approach. And fecal microbiota transplantation, in my experience, it's extremely efficacious in young cats, especially cats with antibiotic-induced uh, dysbiosis. And the role of FMT in cats with chronic enteropathy needs to be further investigated. But on, in my experience, clinical experience, it's quite, it's quite promising as a part of a multimodal therapy. And I want to all thank you for your attention by showing you Leona and Regina. They are my cats. They're strictly indoor cats. And they happen to be how fecal, feline fecal, fecal donors. And they have inspired the, the textbook uh, Jan Sokodolsky kindly referred to uh, during my introduction, uh, which is the only uh, textbook dedicated to feline GI disease, where you'll find lots of information on dysbiosis. And this was their dysbiosis index. It's quite interesting to show that they share the same environment, same, same diet and same anxious owners, and they have a perfectly identical dysbiosis uh, uh, index. And with this, I, I should thank you once again, and I'm very happy to take any any questions or to move on to how?